Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the presidential address and award ceremony of NCA's 100th annual convention. My name is Nancy Kidd. I'm the executive director of NCA. And it is my honor this evening to introduce our centennial president, Kathleen J. Turner. Dr. Turner is professor and chair of communication studies and director of oral communication at Davidson College. Her BA in speech communication and English is from the University of Kansas. And her MA and PhD in communication are from Purdue University. A rhetorical analyst, Dr. Turner studies communication as a process of social influence, particularly concerning media, politics, popular culture, and women's issues. She is the author of Lyndon Johnson's Dual War, Vietnam and the Press, the first book in communication to be published by the University of Chicago Press. She is also editor of the important and influential collection of essays entitled Doing Rhetorical History, Concepts and Cases, published by the University of Alabama Press. There is a richness and breadth to her scholarly interests, from Miami Vice and 60s protest music to the study of presidential libraries, from Time Magazine's coverage of religion to comic strips. Her contributions to rhetorical studies are insightful and far-reaching. Most recently, in the scholarship of teaching and learning, she has co-authored a volume on communication centers that is currently in press. Dr. Dr. Turner's colleagues recognize her teaching acumen, she has received NCA's highest honor for outstanding teaching in higher education, the Donald H. Eckroyd Award. She relishes leading seminars and serving as scholar in residence for NCA's Institute for Faculty Development, otherwise known as the HOPE Conference. She also has a long record of leadership service to NCA. In addition to progression through the presidential succession roles on the executive committee, she has served as chair of the Communication Center section, the Public Address Division, the Carl Wallace Memorial Award Committee, and the Golden Anniversary Award Committee, and she co-chaired the Leadership Development Committee. Personally, I'd like to say that it has been a true pleasure working with Kathy throughout her officer rotation, and especially during this presidential year, when her deep commitment to the discipline and the association has been evident in her hard work and very thoughtful counsel. Kathy's kindness, good humor, and warmth radiate. Her commitment and good spirit were perhaps most notable late one night when following an NCA meeting in Washington, D.C., after hours and hours and hours at the airport, her flight was ultimately canceled, and she came to my house to spend the night. While others might have been grouchy at that point, Kathy arrived at our door smiling, joined us for a midnight Haitian rum, and gamely arose at 4 a.m. to attempt her journey once again. My kids, who are very young, jokingly call her my invisible work friend, because she arrived after they had gone to bed and was gone before they woke up. But her attitude is that it's all part of the job. This good spirit and collegiality is infused in all of Kathy's work. Kathy has strongly led us through many complex strategic challenges this year, and her presidential initiative on the centrality of communication, still underway, promises to have significant impact on the ways in which the importance of our discipline is understood by a multitude of relevant parties, from students of all ages, to our colleagues in other departments, to deans and provosts. Dr. Turner's address is titled, Back to Our Future, The Presence of Our Pasts, The Echoes of Our Future. Please join me in welcoming our president, Kathy Turner. Hello, NCA. <laughs> Thanks so much to Nancy for those very gracious words. I'm reminded of what Lyndon Johnson would say in a situation like this. I wish my parents could be present because my daddy would like it and my mama would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's especially gratifying for those words to come from Dr. Kidd because the more I have worked with her, the more I have discovered that she is smart, she is savvy, and she is sensitive. It's been a true joy. I would also like to thank my amazing mother. When I told her that I was going to run for this leadership position, she said, why? <laughs> and I said, because that's how you raised me. 
I would also like to, ha to thank my amazing husband. He takes me seriously, but he won't let me take myself too seriously, and those are two incredible gifts. I would also like to thank Trevor Perry Giles from the National Office. Anytime you see the National Office up here, it means Trevor's been at work. And to John and Jason and Alfonso and the amazing crew at the Hilton who have worked so hard to get everything set up well. Now, I've got a whole lot more thanks to give, but if I start on that list, we're going to be here until November of 2015, and none of us want that. So I hope you know who you are, and I hope you appreciate how grateful I am. When I entered the University of Kansas, I was going to be a language arts secondary ed major. I knew that that was my future. I had always wanted to be a teacher, even though I took side trips into ballet and architect. But no, I really wanted to be a teacher. I always came back to that. And I had discovered the joy of debate and extemp in high school. I had found that my lifelong family fascination with language had theoretical roots in general semantics. And in addition, I learned that you really could do this. But you know, a funny thing happened on my way through that freshman year. I discovered communication. And my world exploded in the best possible way. In addition, I discovered that you didn't have to be a pointy-headed intellectual to be a professor. <laughs> right? All you had to do was to love sharing and generating ideas. That's all. And if you loved that and you did it well, you could be a professor. And I thought that was really cool. So as a freshman, I decided that I would be a double major in speech communication and English, and that I would go on to get my PhD. Now I know that some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, she was precocious. And some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, she's a nerd. I would simply like to point out that the two terms are not mutually exclusive. I never looked back. By the time I was a junior, which was 1972, I was so excited because I had the opportunity to come to our national convention. It was in Chicago. It was then the Speech Communication Association. And then it was held between Christmas and New Year's. And that meant in order to go to the convention, I had to pass my final exams. As I was studying, the guys who lived in the apartment upstairs came down and said, oh, Kathy, come on, take a break. Let's go out and go sledding, right? Unfortunately, that break turned out to be more literal than figurative. Because on my second trip down Mount Oriad, my hat fell in my eyes, and I ran into a telephone pole. I encountered the dark side of nonverbal communication. <laughs> I ended up with a concussion, with several broken ribs, and with a badly damaged right arm. But I was determined to come to the convention. And so, I attended my first convention after that encounter with the sled in the Palmer House, wearing a bright turquoise sling. My mother was not going to send me in any old muslin sling. And I had foam down my back and in my arm, and I had a host of painkillers, but I was so excited about this opportunity. Now, I looked really awful. I looked so awful, I'm not going to show you a picture. <laughs> But I just couldn't wait to see and hear and maybe even meet those amazing people who had written my textbooks, who had written those articles that so energized me. I just couldn't wait. And you know something? By the second day of the convention, I was having such a good time that it was only later that I realized I had completely forgotten to take the painkillers. And I have been hooked on NCA ever since. 
Now, despite my eagerness to attend that first convention, I've got to confess, I didn't know diddly about the origins of this organization. If Michael J. Fox were here, in his incarnation of Marty McFly, we might jump in the DeLorean and go back in time, but we actually have a much more powerful vehicle to cross time and space. We have communication. So join me as we go back to our future. By this point in our centennial convention, I'd be really surprised if you haven't heard at least one version of our origin story. Has anybody not heard at least one version? Oh, good. Or are you too embarrassed to confess it? Maybe that too. In this very city, in 1914, 17 brave forebears gathered and rejected their lowly status as the red-headed stepchildren of English in order to form the National Communication Association. Okay, indulge me. I love rhetorical history. So let me set the stage. Our civilly disobedient 17 would have been among the very elite at this time, according to the Commissioner of Education, in 1914, 91% of American children attended elementary school. When you get to secondary school, it goes down to 7%. And when you get to college, it's less than 2%. So we haven't, I hadn't really realized until I looked at this just how privileged our forebears were. What's more, our feisty 17, wouldn't have flown to Chicago because, would you want to travel in that? Passenger airlines were just barely getting started. Nor would they have driven because the average cost of a car was $500. The average annual wage was $577. And we all know how academics rank, right? No, most of them took a train. And yes, Ted Shekels, even from here, I can hear you smiling. On the way, our forebears wouldn't have checked email and texted on their cell phones, and they wouldn't have snapped open their laptops and put the finishing touches on their convention papers or, in dire circumstances, started their convention papers. <laughs> that never happens to us, right? No, they probably would have opened a newspaper or a magazine and they might have read about the first transcontinental telephone line that went from New York City to San Francisco. Or they might have read about, whoa, where did you go? It got very enthusiastic there. They might have read about women's suffrage and the efforts to extend votes for women beyond the 11 states and the territory of Alaska that currently granted them. Or they might have read about the war breaking out in Europe. Footnote, this is before we started numbering them. And they certainly would have skimmed the advertisements for products like Polarine and Pond's Vanishing Cream. Now, they probably would not have read about how three Howard students formed the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity to encourage, where did you go? Ah, thank you, I skipped a part. They would not have read about the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. It was started by three students at Howard to encourage brothership, brotherhood, scholarship, and service. And they certainly would not have read about women who were members of the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House because there were none. Once they arrived in the Windy City, and yes, that moniker was popularized at least 50 years before this convention, our Savvy 17 might have checked out the skyscrapers that were turning the vertical prairie into the horizontal prairie into the vertical city. And they might have splurged at the Boulevard Cafe. Why is this jumping so? You know, I asked myself, I'm a techno-dinosaur. Why on earth 
Did I choose to do this with PowerPoint? <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Okay, so they might have chosen to splurge at the uh, Boulevard Cafe for the table d'hote, consisting of shell oysters, fish, choice of fowl, filet of beef, fresh vegetables, strawberries, cheese, coffee, and a full pint of the very best California claret, all for an outrageous price of 75 cents. <laughs> Clearly, though, the focal point for this trip, for our Sassy 17, would have been the convention of the National Council of Teachers of English. Among those attending that convention just might have been the instructor of the oral English course that my granddaddy Turner took at KU in roughly 1909 or so. Now our forebears were acutely aware that the number of institutions of higher learning offering a major in their chosen field was zip. And so you can imagine what that does for graduate study, also zip. And they felt like second or third or sometimes fourth class citizens in the English departments where they chafed against what, in Mary Catherine Bateson's delicious phrase, were extremely tweeted minds. I think it's appropriate that they met in Chicago, home of Daniel Burnham, the architect, who enthused, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Well, it did take a little bit for those great plans to stir men's blood. On Friday, November 27th, 1914, the motion that the National Association of Academic Teachers of Public Speaking be organized it enjoyed vigorous debate, and then it was tabled, 18 to 16. Not until the next day would 17 men, representing 13 institutions, vote unanimously to establish our association. And you will note that these institutions are both public and private, both teaching and research oriented. Now there is some speculation, I mean, if you've been thinking about 18 to 16 the first day and then it goes to 17, what happened in between? There is some speculation that the mild weather in Chicago that Saturday, much like we've been enjoying this week, <laughs> no, may have drawn some of those who would have voted to stay with the English folks out of the hotel and therefore out of the equation. And so, in 1915, we had our very first convention for the National Association of Academic Teachers of Public Speaking, or NAPS, as rolls so trippingly off the tongue. Okay. Now, I would note that these rebels met at the same time and in the same place with the National Council of Teachers of English. And what's more, one afternoon, they all adjourned from their convention to go to the conference sessions at the National, so National Council of Teachers of English so that they could attend the public speaking panels that were offered there. So it wasn't exactly a clean break. But we had a hearty 30 members, 60 members, excuse me, attending that convention, paying membership dues of $2, paying a conference fee of $1. 16 people appeared on the program, the treasurer reported a deficit of $508.69 with loans from members amounting to $479. Those were our beginnings. We've come a long way since 1914. And we've had a lot of adventures in the process. Think about it. We've had five general sessions and four periods of special sessions. This was in 1933. One year, 52 institutions granted advanced degrees to 450 candidates. That was in 1948, our silver anniversary. Lyle L. Crocker served as president while teaching 
seven classes a semester at Denison. The wives of officers hosted a reception for the wives of faculty, a tradition that Bobby Patton discovered carried over into the early 70s. Mike and Susie Osborne covered their walls with butcher paper and then used color-coded index cards to schedule the 1987 convention. All of us who are more recent primary program planners say thank you, Michelle Randall and NCA Convention Central. Now, we aren't quite at the 10,000 members that Andrew Weaver predicted we would be back in 1927. This year, NCA boasts almost 8,000 members, almost 5,400 people on the program, almost 1,200 sessions. We got a bunch of folks here. And we're a long way from that 500 and 500 some dollars in debt, okay? We have enough in our coffers to offer amazing benefits to our members, such as electronic access to 11 journals for every single member of this association. Okay. Honestly, I think that while our original 17 would have been busting their buttons at the idea of 11 full journals, they would have been scratching their heads about electronic access. So that begs the question, why? Why are we so strong? What has NCA inherited from our pasts that we can carry into our future? I would posit that it is because we study the process that makes us human. We know, as Socrates told us oh so long ago, that communication is the process through which we create, maintain, and change our societies as well as our place in them. The very act of communication isn't added on afterwards. It's generative. It's there from the get-go. It's a fundamental way of knowing and experiencing and enjoying our world. To paraphrase Michael Calvin McGee, we might study speeches or nonverbal communication or uh, any of the subjects that are addressed by our now 48 divisions as of this morning, six sections, six caucuses, but you know what we're really studying? We're really studying human lives. To illustrate the point, my beloved undergraduate advisor from KU, Will Linku, was a major baseball fan. And he used to talk about the three umpires. He said, the first umpire says, I call them as they are. The second umpire says, I call them as I see them. The third umpire says, whatever I call them, that's what they are. <laughs> Those of us in communication understand that whatever we call it, that's what it is. That is the power of communication. That's the power of what we study. And we also understand what Marshall McLuhan was talking about when he said he's not sure who discovered water, but he's pretty sure it wasn't the fish. We are the fish in the water of communication, but we're the ones who help turn that transparency opaque and help people study, analyze, assess, and adapt. As a community of communication enthusiasts, the fact that communication is so ubiquitous is both the challenge and the joy. And we have so many sources of joy. One source is seeing our students who suddenly say, gee, so that's why that Russian student used language so differently. Or the student who said, maybe the concepts in this chapter would be useful as I'm dealing with some conflicts with my roommates. Or the students who come in and say, you know, 
I can't watch programs with my friends anymore because I'm constantly analyzing what's going on there. And I say, yes! Another is watching faculty in other departments when they have our graduate students. And all of a sudden, they're not only learning more about our discipline, they're learning more about their own. A third is how our members, inside the academy and out, give voice to the voiceless, enhance political literacy, engage in collaborative decision making, help the leaders of nonprofit organizations give eloquent voice to the causes they so cherish. That's communication. Marie Hockmuth Nichols pointed out that communication has persisted because we have always evaluated the new idea or word in terms of our ancient, contemporary, and everlasting needs to communicate and work with others in a changing society. 1914, 2014, now let's take a look at the echoes of our future. I am sure that you will be shocked, shocked, to hear that I predict that the National Communication Association will be alive and well and thriving in 2114. You can pick your jaws up off the floor now. And I will predict that we will celebrate our bicentennial right back here in Chicago. I also predict, but I also fervently hope, that we will continue to move forward in the next century in three key areas that I see as interrelated. One is demographic diversity, one is intellectual diversity, and one is social impact. First, for demographic diversity. In 2114, we will be a richly diverse organization. And it may become noteworthy when, oh my gosh, a white person got elected to the leadership. Let's hope that our members in 2114 look back on the task force on inclusivity in the discipline that the incomparable, incomparable Brenda J. Allen is heading and say, oh my, how quaint. It's not exactly going far out on a limb to predict that we're going to be more demographically diverse because the United States has already passed the point where more of the, of the births in the United States, more are babies of color. And so it's gonna happen. In 2000, my dear friend and mentor, Ray McCarroll, urged us to color outside the lines. As he said, to transgress prohibitions, to cross borders, and challenge and redraw boundaries as a way of drawing connections between and among disparate groupings and reconceptualizing conventional strategies. Now, today those lines are still pretty clear. I would imagine that our students don't leave our classes a couple weeks in, into the semester and, in my case, walk down the hall and say, oh my gosh, Dr. Turner's white, and I'm pretty sure she's a woman. Right? They process that instantaneously. But by 2114, I predict that our categories of demographic classification will have changed, if not dissolved entirely. Think, for example, of the Native American concept of two-spirited people for those who embody cross-gender roles. Think of Tiger Woods coining Cablin Asian to describe his Caucasian, black, American Indian, and Asian ancestry. Given our understanding of the power of language, maybe those new labels will help us to see each other in new ways. That richer demographic diversity will be critical to our intellectual diversity. We will study communication of the people, by the people, for the people, all of the people, in all of their delicious depth and difference, in all of their compelling complexity and commonality. As I've said elsewhere, claims of a full and robust understanding of communication processes ring hollow 
if we only study select folks in particular settings pursuing similar goals. We need to cherish what Marcia Houston and Julia Wood call, and I love this phrase, nourishing curiosity toward differences. Thank you. Thank you. And those differences can't just be demographic. In a presidential address entitled Unity in Diversity, Wilbur E. Gilman worried that with the increasing diversification of our interests, can we preserve our unity and function as a team? Does this sound familiar? Well, you know, he said it in 1951, before even I was born. Now, like Anita Taylor in 1918, I don't wish to awaken all those self-examination orgies. Whether we see NCA as an umbrella, or a constellation, or a tossed salad, or whatever other metaphor you want to use, we'll use our communicative expertise to leverage the breadth of our discipline. Rather than fretting about the range of subjects and methodologies and theories, we can embrace that wonderful, wide evidence that we are rich and robust. That it is, as one author posits, a sign of the profession's vitality, its openness to new ideas, and its willingness to allow a thousand flowers to bloom. We can embrace Mike Osborne's contention that our identity is uncertain and must be uncertain because of the nature of the subject matter that we've chosen to engage. And if nothing else, I assure you, we can be happy that we are fulfilling the prediction of James O'Neill at our association's very first presidential address. He felt sure that we would be spared the blight of unanimity for some time to come. <laughs> and because of our demographic and intellectual diversity, we'll have greater social impact. In 1943, Robert West posited that we will progress farther along the way toward a good life for all if we spread our knowledge as widely as possible rather than hold it for a small intellectual aristocracy. In 2114, we're going to be spreading the wealth around to foundations and government organizations, to health organizations and nonprofit associations. Look, it's a great way to test our theoretical concepts while addressing the very real problems that our societies face. And what's more, now I know this is going to be a somewhat scary thought for some of you, we're going to have a gazillion Kathleen Hall Jamesons. <laughs> what I mean is that our members will be sought out by members of the media in whatever forms those new media will take. They will be sought out because they have insightful, incisive observations that help people make sense of the world they live in. And I'm hoping that by that point, they will be identified as communication scholars, not political scientists or sociologists or whatever. And in addition, the museums of the future will eagerly seek our panels on topics of public concern. As Michael Sproul observed, our history is one of integrating inquiry and instruction. And I would add, so too is our future. Now in 2114, as Tom Soha suggested, we might be having our exciting, exhilarating, exhausting conventions via holograms. But they're going to continue to be places where new ideas are born and nurtured and set free to encourage the growth of more new ideas. Our research, our teaching, our service, our professional work all serve to pay it forward. We're going to continue to attract strong, heart-driven, joyful, compassionate, genuine human beings because we study the most exciting aspect of human existence. So why look at the presence of our pasts to identify the echoes of our future. 
You could follow the reasoning of historian David McCullough. Learning about history is an antidote to the hubris of the present, the idea that everything in our lives is the ultimate. But you know, I prefer the perspective of Eric King Watt's grandfather. That's Eric, not the grandfather. Eric says that for his grandfather, history was never simply behind him. It walked beside him, and once in a while, it raced out in front to alert him to what might lurk around the next bend in the road. And he would school me on how to hear the wisdom of my ancestors, whistling through the winds of time. Is that not beautiful? History isn't some musty, dusty relic of the past. Our constructions of history live in us. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before, and we will help lift up those who follow us. Now, I've had quite a few adventures serving as the grand poobah of NCA. Personally, it has included perfecting my queenly wave. Oops, not that one. And if you would like personalized instruction, I will be happy to pass along the techniques that were taught to me by a former Miss North Carolina. And it includes making my YouTube debut on the Happy at Hope video. I included the girls so that you can see it really does exist. Okay. I'm very proud that Scott Myers and I won the sobriquet of cutest couple. More importantly, I feel happier than a slinky on an escalator because I've been able to learn so much about our members, our achievements, and our association. You can too. Attend a conference session with student leaders or one of the undergraduate honors conferences and you're gonna see we're in good hands. Participate in discussions of the bylaws with committed, thoughtful members who really care about the future of the organization. Meet some of the wonderful people in our profession, from Shahani Was, who did her master's thesis on the value of teaching public speaking to elementary school students, to Richard Johnson, or, a or RJ, who is a longtime life member of NCA who still relishes coming to our conferences because he still relishes the intellectual engagement. See that span, and you see what binds us together. Forty-some years ago, as I wandered around that convention, so starstruck and so banged up, little could I imagine that I would be standing here tonight with the honor of serving as the president of NCA in its centennial year. And you know something? I'm still gobsmacked at that. So don't be shy. Somewhere out there, there are the leaders of the National Communication Association for 2039, which will be our quasquicentennial. <laughs> Say that three times fast. Join the joy, and you too will be hooked on NCA. And so I say, to our next 100 years. <laughs>